Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text for this day comes to us from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. At that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus spoke these words of peace and comfort just after he had spoken some rather harsh words against the cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. Quite a juxtaposition with what he now speaks today. Now of all the cities in the ancient world, these three, Gorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, were among the most blessed by God. Many of the mighty works that Jesus did were done in them. In Bethsaida, Jesus healed the multitudes, including the blind man at the pool. He also fed 5,000 in Bethsaida. In Capernaum, he healed the paralytic who was lowered down into his presence through the hole in the roof. In Capernaum, he healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. In Capernaum, he walked on the sea. Finally, in Capernaum, he preached that great sermon, the discourse on the bread of life found in John chapter 6, saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And yet amidst all these miracles, by and large, the people of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum rejected Jesus and the gospel that he preached. Rather than repent of their sins and turn to God humbly for forgiveness, they went their own way, a way that ultimately ends in death and destruction. In fact, of the three great cities of the ancient world, virtually nothing remains of Chorazin or Bethsaida. Only faint traces seem to be found of Capernaum. Now why go back? Why reach back? to hear these harsh words before the gospel for appointed for today. Well, in part, it helps to set the stage for what Jesus says, but also because these three cities can help us to better understand today's reading, mainly because these cities are much like our cities today. You see, the gospel of Jesus' life Death and resurrection flows freely through the streets of our cities, down our highways, into the very heights of Wall Street, into the depths of the slums in Los Angeles, from the highest peak of the Rocky Mountains to the depths of that city below the sea, El Centro. No people on earth, it would seem, have been blessed with the outpouring of the gospel and with as many providential gifts as we have here in the United States of America. And yet, by and large, we as a nation have rejected repentance and grace for those more palatable doctrines of 
tolerance, permissiveness. The greatest sin, it seems now, is to actually call something a sin. Even love, that most difficult sacrifice that Jesus says is the fulfillment of God's law, is morphing now into unrecognizable forms, into a feeling that is without substance or meaning. And like those ancient great cities, we are called to repent of our disregard for God's word, our disregard for his gracious care of our people and our land. In a hundred years, 200 years, 500 years, in the classrooms of some nation or some culture that is yet to be, when they talk about the United States of America, what will they say? What might our country's epitaph be? This was America, a land of God's great blessing and a people devoted to his name. Or, this was America, a land of God's great blessing, and a people who went their own way. But the danger of sermons like this is that we are sometimes led to feeling rather self-righteous. And self-righteousness is a sin as grievous as being wayward. It's cheered on and encouraged when we talk about all those other people that have made a mess of our country. But if we are to hear Jesus' invitation to the weary, to the heavy laden, to come to him, then we need to first see ourselves as the problem, not the solution. The fact is that while our nation may seem to have turned from God and has gone its own way, you and I do the very same thing. Countless times, in our own ways. That brings me to think of St. Paul, the apostle who laments the very same thing in his own life. In the epistle appointed for today, he says, I find it to be a law that is a rule, a very common thing that happens. I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. What Paul confesses is systemic. It's something that invades his whole being. It's something he can't even understand, much less control, or master. You see, there is a part of him that delights in God. That part is there because he's a man of faith, faith in Christ the crucified. But there is then another part of him that wages a war against God. It makes him captive to sin, the sin that dwells in him. Paul, like every one of us, is that living contradiction of what it means to be Christian. While he wants to do one thing, to love God with his whole heart, his whole mind, his whole soul, he often does another. I do not understand my own actions, he says, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And Paul's conflict is mirrored time and time again in each of us as we visit those sins that seem to have a very deep, very deep-rooted place within our flesh, that thorn that we cannot pull out. These sins that we revisit time and time again, we confess them to God. We ask him to create in us a clean heart and to renew in us a right spirit. We long to conquer these sins, to find victory over them, to be that new man in Christ that, that only faintly remembers these deeds of the old man. 
and yet we are living contradictions. Christians who delight in the law of God, but whose member violate that law time and time again. At the end of this confession of St. Paul, in chapter 7 of Romans, he says he's tired. He's tired of himself. He's tired of this inner conflict. He's tired of this contradiction. Perhaps more than anything, he's tired of his actions that seem so often to deny God. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? His answer, of course, is Christ. Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He delivers me from this body of death. And so it is when you grow tired of yourself, when you grow tired of your waywardness, of your inner conflict, there is the voice of that one, that one with a capital O, who calls you to come to him for rest. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This rest doesn't manifest in the cessation of this inner conflict. In fact, until the day that you die, unless the second coming happens before that day, you will remain a saint and a sinner, and yet you still have rest for your soul. In the very first chapter of Romans 8, the chapter right after this one today, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And to such a wonderful promise, to the gospel that we hear, that old man is inclined to say, Yeah, but. Yeah, but I did it again. Yeah, but I got angry when I shouldn't have. I know I shouldn't have, but I did. Yeah, I failed to stop and help that person when I know I could have, when I know I should have. And so finally, all those yeah, buts, those yeah, buts can become a terror on the conscience. And strangely enough, we might even find that they they lead us to think that we need to atone for what we've done, that we need to start to do some works to make up for this. And once we start to try to earn our way into heaven, we're going to get more tired. More tired still because that will never end. Because there's nothing that we do in and of ourselves to merit forgiveness, the life and salvation that Christ gives to us freely. Freely on the cross. And so before you this morning, this Savior who calls you out of yourself, that you might out of yourself then find rest within Him, He says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He says, learn from me, not how to be gentle and lowly in heart, not how to behave that you can work your way into heaven, but learn this about him, that he is gentle, he is lowly. He gives to you without asking, without price. He gives to you rest for your souls. Jesus' body and blood, broken and poured out for you, absolves you of sin. It silences all those yeah buts because he declares you righteous. And his word is true. His word makes things happen. His word makes you righteous. And you are a new creation. A new creation in Christ Jesus. 
And therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in him. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.